Thanks for coming along tonight on this uh, night of bad weather again, but it's great to have Olga Dush here, who has been brought to Australia by Colin Rubenstein and our friends at the Australia, Israel and Jewish Affairs Council, AJAC, and we're very grateful for AJAC for making our speaker available to us for this hour tonight. Now, I'll introduce her briefly. The topic is the global rise of anti-Semitism uh, with a focus on Europe. Now, Olga Deutsch uh, has a background in business. Uh, she's currently Vice President, Research Institute, NGO Monitor in Jerusalem. Uh, she was born in Serbia and speaks Serbian, German, Hebrew, and fortunately, English, <laughs> which is a help tonight. Uh, so welcome to Olga Deutsch on the global rise of anti-Semitism with a focus on Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight at this rain and competing with uh, President Zelensky. I hope I'll, uh, I'll do your patience justice. Um, I'd like to extend my heartfelt uh, gratitude to the Sydney Institute, as well as to AJAC, who have allowed me to be uh, uh, your guest here tonight. It is uh, an honor and a pleasure to be in Sydney. This is my first ever visit to Australia, so the excitement is even, even greater. Um, I will talk about uh, the rise uh, in anti-Semitism globally um, and endeavors, ongoing endeavors to understand what it actually means, how we can monitor it, as well as um, once we understand it, what is it that we could possibly do to try to remedy it uh, on a policy level. Uh, focus on Europe will be lessons learned in the steps that Europe has undertaken so far, and hopefully bringing it to in the Australian context so that um, you might uh, get a few shortcuts and uh, you don't have to uh, do the longer uh, way as Europe had to. So it is no surprise that um, we have been all witnessing uh, a dire rise in anti-Semitism over the last several years. It became um, horrifying in 2018 and 19 with the Pittsburgh synagogue shooting and the Halle in Germany uh, synagogue shooting uh, because those all of a sudden uh, jumped us from, um, from terror, uh, verbal um, anti-Semitic attacks and, uh, and monitoring it into, into the, the things that we haven't seen in years, which is fatalities and shootings in our uh, synagogues. Last year, however, saw an even greater rise in anti-Semitism. The uh, ADL, uh, Anti-Defamation League, in, in their uh, annual report on anti-Semitism, um, reported that 60% of uh, American Jews experienced some type of anti-Semitism, anti-Semitic uh, uh, attack, verbal or other, in 2021. In New York alone, 38% of hate crimes were anti-Semitic in 2021. In uh, France, UK, and Germany, respectively, last year saw an increase by 75, 34, and 30%. And here in Australia, you recorded an increase of 35%. Now, why was last year special? What was different? Most of the people debating uh, this will say that it was the May-Gaza conflict, which brings us to the heart of, the, of what I would like to dedicate most of, I, most of my uh, talk tonight on, and that is understanding contemporary manifestations of anti-Semitism, and that is Israel. Um, Colin and I were in uh, Canberra this morning, and in our conversations with the members of the parliament, um, uh, I quoted the late Rabbi Sachs, the, the chief rabbi of, uh, of UK, uh, may his blessing, uh, memory be of blessed memory, um, and he used to compare anti-Semitism to a mutating virus. And he said it keeps evolving throughout ages. In the medieval times, Jews were prosecuted as, uh, based a, as a religion, right? And the way to normalize that in a broader society was through church and religious theological explanations. In the 19th and 20th century, Jews were prosecuted for their race. 
And then we saw quasi uh, scientific attempts to explain that to the broader public and normalize it. The the, la the last and the the most fatal and catastrophic manifestation of that being the the theory of race and in Nazi Germany. In modern times, the Jews are being prosecuted for all these things, but also for their nation state, the state of Israel, the only Jewish democracy. And the way to normalize that in the broader discourse, discourse and in the public is through human rights. Late Rabbi Sachs used to say that when you hear someone uh, questioning the right of Jews for self-determination and the right of the state of Israel to exist, in the context of human rights, meaning that Israel is violating human rights or Israel is an apartheid state and so on and so on, you are probably looking into the eyes of an anti-Semite, just in, a, in modern uh, wardrobe. Interestingly, the American Jewish Committee conducted a study together with a French uh, local think tank that was released only about a month ago, um, on what constituted anti-Semitism, uh, they polled French citizens, uh, what constituted anti-Semitism in 2021 in France. And interestingly enough, the, those who identified as Jews, 62% of them said that rejection and hatred of Israel was the source of anti-Semitism. But when they polled those identifying themselves as culturally or religiously Muslim, and Catholic, the, the percentages were similar. Those who identified Muslim, uh, they, they were 46% and Catholic 53. Meaning that across the denominations, is rejecting and hating Israel was identified as one of the main sources of contemporary anti-Semitism. A month and a half ago, we saw Amnesty International's uh, report uh, of over 100 pages uh, claiming or trying to make a legal argument that Israel is an apartheid. Basically, the report said that Israel from its creation in 1948 is a systematic endeavor to impose Jewish supremacy over another race, systematic on a governmental level throughout its all, all policies and, and, uh, and institutions. If you pause for a second and think about it, in 2022, is there a gravest, more serious allegation than to call one a racist? And to call that, to accuse a Jewish democracy, the only Jewish state that was created in the ashes of the Holocaust, a racist endeavor is twice as grave as, as in any other case. And this is what I would like to talk about. I, am the, I serve as the vice president of NGO Monitor, a Jerusalem-based research uh, organization created and presided over by Professor Gerald Steinberg. Um, and we focus on a seemingly niche issue, which is the activities of the human rights and humanitarian non-governmental organizations, NGOs, such as Amnesty International, who focus uh, and operate in the context of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, but our research shows, instead of promoting human rights and humanitarian issues, they tend to promote anti-Semitism, uh, different types of delegitimization of the state of Israel. And as we have seen in the last couple of years, in certain cases have clear affiliation and links to terror organizations. I'll give you a few examples of how they do that and how that manifests itself in the practice. And then in the, in the later part of my presentation, I'd like to actually share with you some of the policy best practices with focus on Europe. And hopefully in the, in the Q&A part of, the, uh, of this evening, we can have a discussion uh, on what that means, uh, which of these solutions were uh, uh, successful and how that can apply, be applicable in the Australian context. So we mentioned the Amnesty's report, but the Amnesty's report uh, making an allegation that Israel is apartheid is not a standalone one. It is third of its kind only in the last year and a half. The first one was issued by Human Rights Watch, another global so-called human rights organization, followed by another one making exactly the same claim uh, by B'Tselem, an Israeli so-called human rights organization. 
Interestingly, Amnesty's report, if you uh, analyze it, most of the sources in footnotes lead to the same few NGOs, including HRW and Betselem. And um, uh, on the other hand, a series of terror-linked organizations. Let me enlighten you what that means. In August 2019, there was a terror attack. Uh, it took place uh, in near Jerusalem. Uh, a girl, Rina Schnur, who was 16, took a stroll with her father and her brother, and an explosive was detonated, which killed her on spot. Three months later, in December 2019, Israeli media reported that Israeli security uh, authorities, secu uh, police basically arrested a PFLP, Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, an, a terror group designated as such by the EU, US, Canada, and obviously Israel, um, that a 50 people uh, PFLP cell was responsible for that. Shockingly, at least five of these 50 were senior employees, executive director, financial director, and so on, of Palestinian human rights and humanitarian groups. One of the groups focusing on agricultural projects, seemingly helping uh, Palestinian peasants to work their land, have easier access in to agricultural infrastructure, and so on. The other one was focusing on health, uh, healthcare. The third one on women issues. So on its own, it seemed like a, like a line of... Uh, of uh, really important uh, civil society representatives. This sparked an incredible uh, wave of shocking reactions uh, uh, around Europe. Why? Because in the moment of their arrest, as well as of the terror attack, all these groups were uh, enjoying generous uh, grants through the official cooperation and development programs of the EU and other European, uh, mainly Western European countries, the Netherlands, uh, France, Belgium, Germany, and S Spain, and so on. The other side, now, these same groups, we have identified uh, a 13 NGOs PFLP terror network that almost operate like a third leg of the organization. Because you have to understand, PFLP is first and foremost a political party, just like Hamas, right? But it is also, it has a terror wing, a military wing. But this one, uh, in a brilliant twist, they have the third wing, which is the NGO network, and the funding that they enjoy from the European governments who, are, who believe that they are helping them develop uh, democratic values, sustainable societies, uh, promote human rights, and so on, um, the funding is not even the, the, the most problematic uh, aspect of the relationship. It is the platform and the legitimacy that working with these governments or putting an EU logo on one of your uh, brochures or activities uh, that, that, the that these governments are lending to these groups. It is the same groups like al haq and DCIP and UAWC that are lobbying against Israel, calling it an apartheid state at the UN and other international forums. Last year alone, the United Nations created two special committees that will be investigating Israel and the allegation that Israel is committing apartheid crimes. Um, the Commission of Inquiry, which is supposed to meet in June on Israel, is a permanent one. All the other commissions of inquiry on other countries, including one on Ukraine that was created, are ad hoc and uh, one-off commissions. That on its own is quite telling. We expect that this year alone, UN will issue at least five reports trying to prove that Israel is an apartheid. There is one purpose to that. All this will be used as, uh, as information and proof that will be sent to the uh, prosecutor of the International Criminal Court in The Hague, trying to prompt them to expedite the case and continue with the investigation. The other side of the NGO angle is that a lot of the same groups promote blatant anti-Semitic narratives and tropes, some of them evoking medieval, old school, call it uh, neo-Nazi uh, uh, anti-Semitic uh, tropes, like Oxfam UK just last summer selling Mein Kampf on their online store, 
when we send them an official letter asking how is this possible in 2020, uh, in 2020, in the summer, we got an official response saying that they took it down, saying that it was an oversight by a junior employee. No matter how young you are, and this is where the challenge for our societies actually comes into the picture, one should know that seeing Hitler's image and a swastika and seeing the word Mein Kampf is not content that should be sold anywhere online, let alone on the online store of an esteemed global human rights church-based organization. In a country like UK that traditionally does not have a serious challenge with anti-Semitism, unlike some other countries in Europe. You have a line of Palestinian organizations, such as Badil, um, that runs an annual co poster contest with that the winner receives a monetary prize. And every year we see a series of posters with anti-Semitic but Israel-focused motives as winners. So in, I can take you back to 2010 when a poster of a Hasidic-looking Jew, um, uh, w you know, with all the vis visibly uh, identifiable uh, um, elements to it, uh, was standing on a box covered with stars of David on a pile of dead Palestinian bodies, holding keys in his hands. And keys are a symbol that Palestinians use to the keys of, to their land that was taken away from them in 1948. So the, uh, the analogy is... Uh, is clear. Or another poster in, in an, uh, that won another year where um, the, the map of Israel was torn in the middle and it's split in pieces, clearly make, making a clear analogy. Or another Palestinian group, Palestinian Medical Relief uh, Services, which is supposed to provide medical services, assist Palestinian people uh, in offering complementary medical services and so on. And they ran in, in one of their annual uh, bulletins a series of, uh, of uh, caricatures uh, by uh, a well-known anti-Israel, anti-Semitic uh, caricat caricaturist, Latouf, one of them featured then Prime Minister of Israel Netanyahu stamping Palestinian babies uh, on their way to the oven with a clear reference to the Holocaust. Another one showed a pile of uh, Palestinian bodies in striped uniforms, again, a clear reference to the Holocaust. And the third one showed a Palestinian old woman covered in uh, her head with the Palestinian flag with a tattooed 1948 on her hand that was bleeding. Again, a clear analogy to the Holocaust. So what we see here is a mer merging of old-fashioned anti-Semitism in the context of Israel as the Jewish democracy. Um, now, we paint we painted the phenomenon right, and we see we see that um, these reports are used as sources of information uh, in discussions on panels in the United Nations in the parliaments of different countries, um, and once they 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 are featured there, we see them trickle down into the policy suggestions, bills that are being proposed uh, and put to vote. And that is the, the, the dangerous part of that. It is not just the mere anti-Semitism, but these groups are being also financially and legitimacy-wise supported by, uh, by the European uh, governments, sometimes knowingly and sometimes not. But as, at the same time, they're being brought in as experts on what is going on on the ground, each time in the context of Jews and Israel committing dire violations of human rights. So again, the anti-Semitism today is brought to us in the context of human rights. I'd like to talk a little bit now about um, how are we dealing with this and what has happened on all these issues in the last two years alone. I want to make it uh, very uh, timely. Um, on the issue of terror-linked uh, affiliated organizations, we have seen that in the aftermath of the terror attack and the involvement of the NGOs, the EU, the Netherlands, and Belgium opened in the first year official investigations into potential diversion of public funds, taxpayers' money, to, to terror through NGOs. 
If you pause for a second and just listen to that sentence, there is a change of paradigm. If 10 and 15 years ago, no one would have entertained a discussion that uh, a human rights NGO can do any wrong, today at least we, we see that, that um, but willingly or not, there are investigations and they are looking into that. Um, in November 2021, a dramatic thing happened that pushed this even further. The state of Israel designated six of these Palestinian NGOs as terror fronts. And I want to focus on what was the language that we used in the designations because this is relevant in the policy discussion. They did not accuse them of funding terror. They did not even accuse them of being terrorists. They accused them of recruiting activists for a designated terror organization. Basically, that means giving them lucrative jobs so that when the network is needed, that, they are, that the network is in place. And for serving as fronts to grant legitimacy and promote the, the in, insightful and hateful narratives of the designated group. And this language is pivotal in trying to understand what is the challenge that we are facing. Uh, if in the past, for example, the EU would say EU uh, funds or EU will not support uh, entities that, are, that appear on the EU list of restrictive uh, measures, which is basically the EU uh, terror list, that was just simply not enough. Because unlike ISIS or Al-Qaeda uh, that also have individuals attached uh, to the names of the organizations on the EU terror list, no Palestinian organization that is listed as a terror group has any individual. So how do you impose that? Which is exactly how a PFLP activist that uh, hijacked a plane in the 60s uh, in 2017 appeared in a packed room in the European Parliament and called to hijack another plane. And there was no legal ground not to allow her to enter the parliament. So in the last two years, we have seen tightening of that language. And the language now that is used says, it will not, we will not tolerate any entity or third party or even workshop hosted that has any affiliation to a terror group that appears on our uh, list, uh, terror list. And that is, that is a, a significant policy shift. On the issue of... Um, now, EU and, and Holland immediately froze their funding, and so did the Germany. The Ger German foreign minister announced in, uh, during her visit last uh, month to Israel that they will not engage with the six designated uh, NGOs. On the front of anti-Semitism itself, we have an extremely important uh, guiding tool, and that is the IRA, Working Definition on Anti-Semitism. IRA stands for the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, and that is an international uh, alliance of governments and other international uh, bodies, including the UN, the EU, OSCD, and so on. So far, now they have come up uh, with a practical definition on what constitutes anti-Semitism. It is a simple definition that has 11 examples attached to it. Examples that actually tells you what are the situations in everyday life that would constitute anti-Semitism. It stipulates criticizing the state of Israel is not anti-Semitic. However, whole, judging it on, whole, uh, on, on double standards that you would not apply to any other state is anti-Semitic. Blaming the local Jewish community in Sydney for the policies of the state of Israel is anti-Semitic. The local community are not Israeli citizens. Uh, comparing Israel to Nazism is anti-Semitic. And it combines these contemporary Zionism or Israel-focused uh, examples with the old school, the neo-Nazi uh, types of anti-Semitism that are easier to identify and the, the broader society knows how to, uh, to, uh, to tell the difference and are easier to condemn, right? Because they also belong to the past, the far right, the neo-Nazis and so on. Um, now, the, this working definition has been so far adopted by 37 different governments, but in total, 865 different entities, governments, local, federal governments, municipalities, universities, schools, uh, in certain cases, Ministry of Education, although the parliament itself hasn't adopted it. It is an incredibly important 
tool. It's this legally non-binding definition, which makes it a policy-wise a much easier tool to work with because it doesn't have to be legislated. And it's not a law. It's a guiding tool that is supposed to help in practical terms identify the situations and navigate sometimes complex waters of distinguishing what is anti-Semitism and what is not today. Adopting it on a parliamentary level is the first and very important step because it sets the tone. It sends a clear message from the elected officials of any one government that we will not tolerate anti-Semitism and this is the tool that we want to use um, to address it. But it is not enough because that is a declarative step. There, 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 if, you, if, it's, if it stays on that level, then the government and its institutions and executive bodies will not know how to implement it uh, in, the, in the practice. There was a case in 2009 uh, in a small city in Germany, for example, um, of an attempt of an arson, of setting a synagogue afi on fire. Three uh, individuals were arrested. It turned out to be pal Palestinian. And in a court case, the judge eventually decided that this was not a hate crime. It was not anti-Semitic. It was merely, and I quote, an expression of political frustration over the events in the Middle East. That would not happen in Germany today because the German government has adopted the IRA working definition and is, uh, has appointed the federal coordinator uh, for combating anti-Semitism, as well as on, on local and regional level, and they, are, they have all been working together in translating this and applying it on different policy levels. The police officers need to be trained and offered tools to know when he or she is making an arrest, whether this is a hate crime, an anti-Semitic crime, or, or a crime. Judges need guidance too. If we in the Jewish community cannot always easily uh, uh, define what constitutes anti-Semitism today, we cannot expect that our fellow non-Jewish uh, citizens will know better than us, right? So the, the IRA working definition is that much more important in, in, uh, in training and, and offering some guidance. The same goes for uh, campuses and universities, whether it is a professor that says a problematic uh, statement uh, sentence in his book or in the lecture and a student feels offended and violated, there should be less of a debate what is anti-Semitic and the IRA working definition can help us there uh, understand whether it was or not. Um, the European Union several years after adopting the IRA working definition on a parliamentary level, in January 2021, uh, issued a handbook on practical implementation of the working definition. The, it's very short and to the point, and it has five policy areas covered there with clear guidelines of how to apply the, the working definition, as well as best practices from different member states. It has Judicial, uh, judicial system, law enforcement, educational system, uh, funding, and international funding. What that means is actually development and cooperation aid, and that is basically funding that goes to NGOs around the world, as well as civil society. And interestingly enough, IRA working definition is used both to promote and support those that use it as a tool to combat anti-Semitism, as well as to sanction those that promote anti-Semitism, because that is the way to benchmark, to, 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 uh, to, to check whether someone is uh, promoting anti-Semitic uh, content or not. There is an ongoing debate in, uh, in Australia, and several different parliaments and, and institutions in Australia have adopted the IRA working definition. But I believe that the lessons learned from Europe are extremely important because they can shorten the way between the declarative, important political statement made by parliaments and different institutions and the practical apl application that will essentially make a difference on the ground. That goes to, to the media, social media and traditional media. The European Commission, the executive body of the European Union, is investing a lot of efforts and resources in working with social media companies in trying to somehow regulate the cyberspace without shrinking the freedom of speech and, and narrowing uh, the, 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 the space online. So these two, like the terror-linked uh, um, guidelines 
and the art of working definition are the two best policy tools that we can apply. Now, that does not mean that we want to restrict or control NGOs, the civil society. Civil society is a is, a, is the, one of the most important, the pivotal backbones of any thriving democracy. Uh, no one knows better than someone like me coming from Europe that in the aftermath of the Second World War, the civil society is almost supposed to, to serve as uh, the conscience of our elected officials. It's a complementary uh, uh, force. But at the same time, we need to demand the same transparency and accountability from the civil society as we do from our elected officials in the public sector and our business uh, businessmen in the private sector. In the first two, the rules are clear, the expectations are uh, clearly defined, and in, in case of a violation between market laws, the legislations, and just the vote of trust or no trust in, in the case of our elected officials, the, the sanction is clear. But when it comes to the third sector, the NGOs, there are no rules. There are no demands of transparency and accountability. There are no vetting procedure who is and who is not an expert on any one issue. Who should be brought into a discussion on this topic and used as a source that will eventually influence the way we discuss the topic and what kind of policies we offer as a, as a, as a remedy. And in that context, I would like to um, offer, I would like to close my remarks and open uh, for your questions and discussion, hoping that, that this was enough, uh, informative enough. Thank you very much. So uh, many thanks to Olga Deutsch for tonight. And so we come to questions and discussion. There'll be some on um, Zoom as well. And I'll, if I'm looking at my phone, that's why. So I'm going to start off. Um, you've given us a very clear definition of uh, anti-Semitism. But not everyone who will be watching this on television eventually will really understand necessarily about the argument of apartheid. Now, when we think of apartheid, we think of South Africa, say, in the 50s and the 60s, before President um, Mandela. Mandela. So why is Israel not an apartheid state? Well, some things are obvious for me. I live in Israel. Um, uh, I'll share with you the, something that has been running on the social media in the last 24 hours in Israel, and, and it has been trending uh, number one. And that is the image of an of a Arab police officer who neutralized the terrorist who, 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 who shot five people to death in Bnei Brak, which is a city uh, near Tel Aviv. That is not an apartheid. Uh, I, I can talk about uh, Arab members of the parliament. Uh, we have Arab Christian Muslim Druze uh, citizens active in all aspects of our life. Um, we are a Jewish democracy, but that does not hamper in any way or, or undermine equal rights of all citizens. Uh, in Israel, coming from Europe that has a clear, we call it today Judeo-Christian uh, heritage, uh, but before the Second World War, no one mentioned the, the Jewish part, um, church plays a critical role, and that does not in any way undermine equal rights of any other minority. But I would actually like to speak most about what I think is the most uh, dramatic in the best of senses development of the last uh, two years. And those are the Abraham Accords. Just before the terror attack, we closed the Negev summit where we saw uh, leaders of four Arab states fly to Israel and sit down with our leaders and talk about technological cooperation, business cooperation, innovation, and security, joint security strategizing over a common security threat in the region. That is not a definition of an apartheid state. We, don't, we cannot even talk anymore about the Arab-Israeli conflict. That is not accurate. There is an Israeli-Palestinian territorial dispute, 
and we can go at length at discussing what might be the solutions, the outcomes, whether it's a two-state solution or any, any other. But there is no Arab-Israeli conflict because the Arab states are working with, uh, hand in hand with Israel and they're proud to do that. In the aftermath of the wave of terror attacks, sadly, because it is clear now that uh, it's, a wa it's another wave that we are witnessing, the Arab leaders were the first to condemn, and they were much, uh, much more vocal than some of the Western uh, elected officials. So I don't know, it's not a legal um, answer to that, although in legal terms, there is no one accepted definition of what constitutes apartheid. There are different uh, uh, definitions in different contexts, but what guides us is more emotional because the only country in the history of human, humankind that was ever called an apartheid was South Africa. And that is what historically and emotionally guides our understanding what apartheid is. And if you talk to anyone uh, from South Africa, I think not only would they tell you that Israel is not an apartheid, but most of them tell me that Calling Israel an apartheid is a relativization of, what, of the unique experience that they went through. Similar to how Holocaust is being uh, rel relativized in attempts to universalize its message and value. What South Africa went through is, uni is, is unique and needs to be respected. It, 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 it deserves its uh, singular place in history the same way that what we went through as people deserve its singular and unique uh, place in history. Thank you. Now, uh, I should say, um, those uh, on Zoom, the instruction for asking a question or making a comment, they were emailed, or they were sent to you in the email that you received today. So um, there's a question here, and then uh, over here. Yeah. Ready to go? Yes. Olga, thank you. Uh, forgive me for being a little parochial, but I'm interested in the way this, some of the statistics that you've pulled out about anti-Semitism throughout the world. Um, you mentioned Australia, 30%. Um, look, I don't move in particularly elevated circles or all over the... I knock around a bit, and I, I don't come across... Very rarely do I come across people just all over, knocking around who... Uh, have got anything about Jews, have uh, display anything of uh, traces Anymore of anti-Semitism. There's particularly, I suppose, in Australia being a multiracial society and pretty multi-political as well in many ways. We've got all sorts of issues going on around here and you get all sorts of adverse comments all over the place. Uh, people take, But, but anti-Semitism, uh, just for me, it doesn't register okay. at all. Okay. Yep. Uh, comment maybe. Well, what you're saying is a good thing. Um, and, and, and I think that compared to many other places, North America and Europe for sure, Australia is, uh, has a much smaller, uh, uh, challenge with anti-Semitism. I, I, I wouldn't even dare talking in, in the same, uh, context. Yet again, the central body that monitors anti-Semitism reported on an increase of 35%. I'm quoting an official report by the central Jewish, uh, uh, body that monitors. And this is exactly, you might not have experienced it, but I'm sure that if I asked someone else, they would have told you that what happened at the Sydney in, uh, Festival was anti-Semitic because it was singling out, uh, you know, so you might not have come across a, a person on the street um, uh, who threw something at you and called, uh, and, you know, called, uh, called you names, uh, or uh, uh, an experience in a local school where a Jewish boy was beaten um, and called a Jew. Different, there are different uh, manifestations of anti-Semitism, and m monitoring them is Im extremely important. And I can tell you that from the European experience, before the, Europe the European Union uh, started working with the, work the IRA working definition, 
There was almost no monitoring because this country was only relying on the numbers of the Jewish community, and the other country had some sort of a, a you know governmental committee that was there was a monitoring uh, racial discrimination altogether. But it wasn't; it didn't have a, a specific uh, uh, focus on anti-Semitism. But because the definition or the the basis, the common denominator uh, that they used to collect the information was not uh, did not exist, there was no way of compiling the information and having a complete picture of what is the what is the actual situation on the ground so i don't know if i answered your question but <laughs> but, uh, no, yeah, but also you're talking about a 35 percent increase you're not uh, from the previous figure it's yeah, yeah. correct olga thank you very much um the new the legislature legislature of new south wales upper house i believe was the first to adopt the ihra uh, definition of anti-semitism and the Greens opposed it. I also know of people who have been seriously ostracized in, in, in the Green Party because of their pro-Israel views. Are the Greens uh, a serious problem in respect to anti-Semitism worldwide? Are, are they um, uh, vulnerable to, to it uh, more than other sectors? Well, let's focus on the Greens in Europe, say. So uh, I can talk about the Greens in the Europe, but the Greens tend to resemble other Greens, Greens uh, around the world. So, um, and I think it's an excellent example of why the IRA working definition is so important. Why do they not adopt it? Only because of the Israel-focused examples in it. They do not contest the, uh, you know, uh, calling... Uh, uh, calling you, you know, hooked nosed Jews or, or uh, talking about protocols of uh, Zion or any of the medieval manifestations of anti-Semitism. They, they criticize uh, all the examples that have to do with the state of Israel, with Zion, the word Zionism, with the, the self-determination of the Jewish people. Um, there is the... Uh, uh, the, Jew the Jerusalem Declaration, for example, which was an attempt, an antidote to the IRA working definition. So a group of academics, all on the far left, on the very progressive side of the political uh, uh, spectrum, they came up with an alternative uh, definition on anti-Semitism. And in the preamble, they write that that is an attempt to, uh, to better the IRA working definition. So clearly it's a reaction. They only talk about what is not anti-Semitism there. And, and, and they, they, they will say, um, I'm not, I'm not going to quote, and I don't want to say that I'm quoting, but allowing Jewish life in Israel, as well as for all citizens. So the word self-determination is taken out, and I think that's quite telling. Now, to your question, the overwhelming support to the IRA working definition, I believe, speaks for itself. 37 countries, almost 900 different bodies, universities, federal, local governments, ministries, and so on, including the UN and the EU and OECD. The more uh, institutions and the more uh, parliaments and countries use the IRA working definition, uh, the, the less legitimacy there will be to the criticism. I, I, you know, but, but criticism is part of the political discourse. As long as they are not being hateful or uh, anti-Semitic, I think it is healthy to have, a, to have a discussion and to challenge each other. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a really broad question that I'm sure you've probably been asked many times. Uh, I find it hard to understand uh, the Jewish people have contributed so much to human existence right from the, the, the get-go um, and still do. So why does anti-Semitism exist in the way it does, particularly in modern society <clears throat> where we're all much better educated? I, I, I just find it an absolute puzzle and um, I know that's a big question but any ideas <laughs> I'm I'm not sure that I am uh, qualified to answer that question I'm not an anthropologist and I'm not a sociologist um, I think that anti-semitism is one of the most ancient types of hatred I uh, I also think that uh, it will never go away entirely 
Um, I believe that the level of anti-Semitism in any one society is an excellent barometer to how healthy human rights-wise and democracy-wise and freedom-wise that society is. It usually starts with the Jews, but it never ends with the Jews. Um, and I think it is an evolving issue. I'll, I'll quote um, an, a U.S. author that Naomi and I have been discussing a lot uh, in the last couple of days, and that is Dara Horn, who in September released a new book. And it says, people love dead Jews, live Jews a little less. And I think part of the challenge is that we too belong to that old paradigm. We keep trying, she says, to teach anti-Semitism, to teach what is anti-Semitism by teaching Holocaust. And that just won't cut it anymore, which is why we need new tools. We need to, uh, we need to understand its sources, its manifestations. We need to be able to identify it and define it if we want to give it a try to address it. Again, I humbly think that we will never eradicate anti-Semitism entirely, but we can continue to, to try, and education is, is the only key. I'll go. You've mentioned language and communication a lot in what you've said this evening. One bit of language that I think is extraordinary is to equate racism with ethnicity. If ever there was a nation state like Israel that has a hell of a lot of different ethnicities and many different races within it, it's a very important distinction that's unfortunately not made. But my question is, you'll know about Antonio Gramsci and his ideas that were picked up with the idea that we won't get a socialist state in Western Europe unless we can somehow or other establish a hegemony, a cultural hegemony over Western Europe that will be supportive of socialism, which of course Marx thought was junior communism. What do you think about the influence of wokeism and what I've just said and this increase in anti-Semitism, which is essentially, in both cases, anti-democratic in its long-term aspirations? Yeah, I don't even know where to begin. Um, you know, we've been accused of so many things. You know, they accuse Jews for being socialists and communists, then they accuse us for being capitalists. <laughs> Uh, in the, the same breath, you know, different, dependent on the, on the time of history and, and, and uh, geography. Of course it is not about the race. And I think that's the, that, that's the point. Anti-Semitism uh, has its root in ignorance. Um, most of the anti-Semites have never met a Jew or been to Israel to talk about whether it is democracy or apartheid and so on. Anyone who knows a little bit about Israel and the Jewish community, the Jewish citizens of Israel, know that we come from all parts of the world and, and we, are, we come in all shapes and colors and forms. Um, and we have dark-skinned uh, Jews and very white Jews. Like, of course it's not about the race. Um, I think that, and I will refer back to late Rabbi Sachs, when he spoke about anti-Semitism, he, he would always say that at the end of the day, it's about finding someone to blame. Because it is, saying, it is saying, it's not about me, it's about them because. And then there would be an answer. Again, in the medieval times, it was because of their religion, which is weird and, you know, uh, all sorts of things. And in the 19th and the 20th century, it's because of their race, because they're different to our race. They're of this or that color or whatever. And then in modern times, it's because of their state. And in modern times, it is politicized even more. I mean, to say that in the medieval times, church was not a political entity would be also uh, ill-informed. Everything is about politics. Uh, but in modern times, it is politicized even more, because our access to information is that much 
larger with the social media and internet and everyone becomes a member of a political discussion. If 20 years ago, in order to be politically engaged, you had to become an activist, you had to go to an actual conference, you had to earn your right to be, to be on a panel or to discuss something. Today, you just go online and you have an opinion. And if you're shocking enough, and concise enough because our messaging has gotten uh, much shorter uh, and sources don't matter anymore. You know, and if you shock enough, uh, enough audience, then you will spark a discussion. And the more comments and likes you get, the more relevant you become completely divorced from what you're saying, whether it is true or not, and whether you are stating any sources or anything. And that's why the, the entire human rights dis discourse and community and the NGOs that are at the heart of them are so potentially dangerous. Just so you understand the magnitude between 2011 and 2018, according to OECD, 30 developed countries, which is North America, Europe, and, uh, and Australia, provided 177 billion US dollars to and through NGOs globally. In the context of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, according to our conservative estimates, because again, there's no transparency across the board, so you can never know all, every year at least 120 million US dollars is being uh, provided to, the, to, to a handful of NGOs. That gives them a seat around the table and it gives them a lot of legitimacy. And this is why we need these tools and we need a broader awareness uh, of what it is that, when do we as Jews feel violated? No one else gets to say that. Thank you, Olga. Um, in the context of the Ukraine and the appalling things that are happening there under Putin, and his sort of excuse that the Nazi movement in Ukraine is at the basis of all this, which is obviously totally exaggerated. But I'd be interested to hear if you have any comments on the state of anti-Semitism in Eastern Europe, particularly in the Ukraine. Is it worse than Western Europe and also in Russia? I think it's different. In, in Western Europe, we tend to see more of a Israel-focused uh, anti-Semitism. It usually comes, not only, but it, it comes a lot in the context of uh, justifying Palestinians or siding with this or that side, so in that context. In Eastern Europe, where media-wise also Russia is extremely influ influential, Sputnik is the main uh, news provider in, in too many Eastern European countries. Um, we see a lot of the old fashioned motives of Jews controlling the world, controlling the media, you know, being everywhere and so on. I think in the context of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, in my humble opinion, uh, using uh, Nazi analogies and Holocaust analogies was less successful on both ends. And uh, and I think it doesn't, it, it by far does not do the justice to what Nazis did and what Holocaust uh, really was. Um, and that goes on, on for both Putin and, uh, and Zelensky. Um, Zelensky also delivered a speech uh, at the Knesset, at the Israeli parliament, uh, a week ago, approximately. And he tried to make a reference to the Holocaust and that, that fired back at him. While everyone said, yes, it was not a, a, the most successful of comments, but we should not lose sight of what is the real issue here, which is the, the incredible humanitarian tragedy and the devastation and, and, and the death toll, right? Um, at the end, because of his comment, the majority of the discussion in Israel was about that, which only tells you how misguided his comment was and, and how unsuccessful, let's put it that way, as a, as a, as a mess in, in terms of messaging. Um, but we see that somehow Israel finds itself in the middle even of this 
conversation in the context of the Russian Russian uh, Ukraine war, the invasion of Ukraine. We saw uh, immediately attempts to uh, compare, draw parallels between Russian occupation and Isra- Israel occupation. We saw uh, a few NGOs immediately tweet that now the Jewish immigrants that will be brought to Israel um, are the ultimate proof of Jewish colonization of the land. Um, and, you know, uh, evoking the Holocaust uh, motives is, is uh, one might just ask a simple question, why? You know, why, why, what, we have nothing to do with this. At the same time, I think it's, it's, it's also a, poly, uh, 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 a strategic opportunity for the state of Israel, now on a, on a more serious note. Um, like every, it's a risky one, because if it doesn't go well, you know, we, we, we might pay a, a political price. But if it does, um, the fact that Israel is being uh, tabled and discussed as a potential um, mediator or messenger, as our prime minister would uh, would may, uh, would say, um, is is, an op- is a political opportunity. It also allows Israel to navigate a very complex uh, situation because Israel has a proxy border with Russia in Syria, um, and it is in close cooperation with uh, Russia that we um, do all our military military operations uh, against Iran and its proxy in. Hezbollah that currently has 130,000 missiles that in, hypothetically are ready to be shot at any uh, moment. And in, on the other side, our clear alliance with the U.S. and the Western democracies. And I think that in there was a poll uh, that was uh, reported on in Washington Post only last week, I believe, that um, 60% of the Israelis actually believe that Israeli government is navigating those complex waters quite successfully. They, while, and that is in no contradiction to the overwhelming support for Ukraine, because there's no question that the Ukrainians are suffering and there is an unbelievable um, recruitment on all levels, uh, institutional and civic, to help fly. Israel just built uh, the field hospital uh, in Ukraine. We have hundreds of volunteers and diplomats flying there, but it is a very complex, uh, complex, uh, complex uh, situation. In our part of the world, everything tends to be complex. <laughs> um, Olga, it's, it's been great. Um, I just want to take you back to one of your earliest comments, and that was the investigation, the permanent investigation in the, of the UN on Israel, the, the Palestinians. How did this come about? I mean, the voting was not very big in, the, in, in terms of the numbers that voted for. But what was the push in the United Nations for it? And, and to what extent will this be important? Or did some people abstain simply because they thought, oh, another body and it won't go anywhere, whatever? I mean, how important is this? development? Well, it's not a new campaign. Uh, Our our NGO monitor was created in the aftermath of the uh, 2001 Durban conference in South Africa. Our uh, our president, Professor Steinberg, um, looked at what was happening there at the NGO summit, and that was the first uh, public announcement in the resolution that was adopted by the NGOs, including the biggest one, Amnesty and HRW and so on, that Zionism is racism. And he said, how is this possible? How, this is at a global UN uh, uh, summit on, on, uh, on, on combating racism, right? Um, and he took a sabbatical and said, I'll take a year and research the role that the NGOs play in this. And 20 years later, here we are. Uh, a full-blown research institute, we're still trying to understand um, how come. Um, the, the campaign is an ongoing one. The UN is also not a democratic body. Uh, a lot of the voting there happens by non-democratic states that side one with another. Um, some of the voting has nothing to do with the topic. It, it's done in blocks, right? Uh, but some of the voting is by the by the states that have no diplomatic relations uh, uh, with Israel whatsoever. Um, most of the Western European countries, uh, the U.S., they will either oppose or abstain. 
but they will also not be present in each of these committees because the the, the 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 states are allocated to committees uh, in a certain key that is not representative of anything particularly. And these NGOs have been active and lobbying for years, for decades. Now, the Abraham Accords uh, that are, again, the antidote to all this and, uh, and I guess the, the positive ray of light, uh, but they, at the same time, I believe that they have forced uh, the NGOs and the other side to intensify their campaign because they could no longer argue that easily that Israel was an apartheid and that it was a pariah state that no one wants to do anything with Israel because the opposite was happening and unfolding in, in front of everyone. And not only was it happening between Israel and the Arab states, but all the other countries were getting so excited to be part of that trialogue or, you know, multilateral uh, dialogue. You now see in every capital around the world that the U.S. ambassador and the UAE ambassador and the Israeli ambassador are doing things together. This is, we live in incredible times. Um, so I think that that's one of the reasons why they have, uh, they have uh, intensified uh, their campaign. And again, the goal is to try and make a legal case to prosecute Israel uh, for for uh, for uh, for human rights crimes, in trying to say that it is not a legitimate enterprise, that there should be no Jewish democracy. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, we had uh, we had some more questions. We could be here all night, but. Uh, we can't be here all night. So many thanks to old Do Olga, <laughs> for Olga, <laughs> Olga Deutsch uh, for uh, a fine address tonight, uh, which has been filmed. It will go up on our website, of course, and eventually we'll, and we'll publish the paper. Uh, but for tonight, um, congratulations, well done, and good luck. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks to Colin Rubinson and AJAC and the team. Yeah.